Welcome to the Royal Chronicles. I'm Hannah. And I'm Luke. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. Today we are finally delving into uh, Isabel of Castile. Most people know of her, you know, in relation to her husband. So you often hear Ferdinand and Isabella or Isabella and Ferdinand. But today it's all about her. Yes. And a lot of people also know about her because she's the Queen of Spain who commissioned Columbus's voyage. Yes, that's probably her most well-known achievement. Don't you think? Probably. Okay. Um, but before we get into it, of course, thank you so much to all of our listeners, followers, subscribers. Um, I noticed we got a couple more in, in the last few days. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. We always really appreciate your time because as we, I so frequently repeat and Luke as well, uh, there's a lot of things out there that you can, you know, spend your time listening to and that sort of thing. So if you spend even a little bit of your time with us, we appreciate it. Um, but actually, before we get into the episode, because I've been posting a couple of shorts on YouTube, um, some of you may know, some of oh, you, if you're new, you might not know. We live in Florida. We live in Central Florida. And the massive hurricane that just came through um, a few days ago, was that last week now? Gosh. Yeah. Um, hurricane Milton, we were in the direct path of that thing and so it's been a little crazy around here because at one point it was up to a category five which is i mean that's that's like as bad as it as it gets more or less um and uh but mercifully by the time it made landfall it was like a three or something yeah and it slowed down pretty fast once it got into the middle of the state right which um where we live we are in the center of the state we're inlanders you might say so we never get hit as hard as the folks on the coast god bless them um but and thank goodness this one even though we were like supposed to be right in the middle of it it was kind of a nothing burger here we were out of power for maybe 36 hours and Mm -hmm. it was back on thank god and um you know not a lot of damage around here so but it was it was a little wild i posted a couple of things on youtube you know just the radar the weather radar and stuff but anyway we're all we're all good we're back up and running and uh, but that's that's kind of what we've been distracted with the last week or so yeah anyway so but enough with that let's get into isabella of castile even though most people tend to think of her as isabella of spain yes we'll get into that yeah okay so luke you want to start with her early years so we don't actually know her act her exact date of birth because it wasn't recorded Mm -hmm. Um, which just kind of goes out starting to show you that her family wasn't quite expecting her to become the ruler of their country. I did look that up <laughs> and Wikipedia, I mean, please, but they claim they, they don't say disputed. It says the 22nd of April, 1451. But it's I think somewhere there is some in there, debate about that. But we don't exactly know. Anyways, continue. <laughs> anyway, um, and she was the... Um, the daughter of the king of Spain, uh, Juan, and she was the daughter of his second wife. Mm -hmm. So he had had a previous marriage where they had had a son. So he had his heir. And then his first wife died. He remarried to a princess from Portugal, um, Maria. Isabella. Isabella. Ah, I always forget that. Well, it's easy to remember because Isabella, Isabella. they have the tradition of, you know, the children are named after yes. the parents. and all. So there's a lot of people with the same name. It's Ugh, extremely confusing. Forget. I think it's her grandmother that's the Maria. I anyway, you might be right, yeah. getting back to the story. Um, she was a princess from Portugal and she married the king of Castile and they had two children. And Isabella was the younger of the two. Her brother, Alfonso. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Although she did, and this is going to be important in a minute, uh, she had a half brother. Uh, oh gosh, what was his name? Enrique. Yes, King Enrique. That'll be that'll yeah, be important. I later. mentioned him. Did you? I'm he sorry. was in the first marriage. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but their relationship will be quite pivotal. Pivotal. <laughs> pivotal um, for the for early portion of her life. Yes. Because pretty early on in her life, her father died Mm -hmm. and um, she and her brother were left in the custody of their mother and um, their brother, their half brother became the king. Right. He was um, not the most popular of kings and he had a tendency to invest a lot of his power in favorites which of course you know as we've discussed many times before that always makes you unpopular (laughs) yeah he he was um interesting he was and um 
So there's a little bit of instability there. Her father's gone. Her older brother and her mother don't get along super well. Um, And then a, I don't know how you'd describe it. Her mother experienced sort of a mental or emotional break. Yeah. Where um, she basically just withdrew from contact with people she just went into a nunnery and basically never came out yeah that's pretty much how she lived the rest of her life yeah okay so as we mentioned enrique or as the english language um material uh they use the english name which is henry Henry. Mm -hmm. um he of course is king and as we said he's an unusual character he um he had some interesting personal issues he never well okay it's believed that he never produced an heir because while he was married Mm -hmm. am i thinking of the right person he was married but um never never produced a child well so he was married twice yes and the first marriage was annulled on the grounds of non-consummation yes but his second and the second marriage the wife had a child complicated but um based off of the king's um seemingly inability to consummate the marriage his first marriage and the um private life of his second wife it's pretty much understood that the child produced was not his child well it was suspected but then later on during a rebellion which we'll probably get into Mm -hmm. um he actually signed a document saying that she wasn't his yes he at first adamantly claimed that it was because he needed an heir obviously Mm -hmm. but then later yeah said she wasn't and that's just that's kind of what stuck even though to the daughter which her name was uh juana Mm -hmm. i believe or or joanna in english um basically till the day she died she believed you know she was the rightful heir and yes she continued his daughter biological sign all of her documents as queen of spain (laughs) yes even though she never was queen of spain anyway so it's all there's also um a debate when you said favorites that um Enrique or Henry, um, pre how do I put this? Preferred the company of men, let's say. That's difficult to judge based on the information we have, Mm -hmm. partly just because the kind of language used at the time would make it confusing. Number one, there were a lot of people at court who wanted to delegitimize him because he was so unpopular. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the standard things that you accuse kings of, especially if one of their Uh, things they're being accused of is following the advice of evil counselors that they're really reliant on so it's but it was difficult to dispel the rumors given what happened to his first marriage and And his second marriage and the doubt about the legitimacy of the daughter yeah so i you know feeding the flame so to speak anyways that's his story and this is all happening while isabella is in her like um late childhood early teens yeah, and based on what I what I've read, it seems to have had his um let's say dysfunction and other people's dysfunction in her life and there were several individuals we I don't think we have time to get into all of them, but from what I understand, it really kind of shaped her in a way that made her very um what's the word I'm looking for? kind of rigid. Ri- yeah, rigid, um very self-reliant. Yeah. Yeah, very kind of modest, extremely religious in her Mm -hmm. Catholic faith. She took it very seriously. Um, And she was just, she was very careful, I guess, in her personal life. That would be another big one for her. It's like she saw all this stuff going on and thought, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to partake in that. I'm not going to let that happen to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, that seems to have been a theme that stayed with her for her entire life certainly after she was married because and and i don't want to you know get get ahead of myself but this definitely shaped her personality a big part of what Mm -hmm. shaped her personality anyway so yeah like we referred to just a moment ago um when she and um and her brother were still young Mm -hmm. um he and his advisors staged a uh rebellion uprising Mm -hmm. against their older brother and tried to take the throne. She took the side of her full brother, Alfonso, mm-hmm. 
But sadly, just after it looked like they were about to win because they had gained the allegiance of most of the major cities and several of the more powerful families in Castile, he mysteriously died yeah. at a dinner. Under mysterious circumstances. <laughs> and it should be noted that poisoning was very common at this yes. point to get rid of one's enemies or just And very difficult to prove family members. or trace. Yes, at the time. So um, being on her brother's side, who the brother Alfonso is now dead, mm-hmm. she had to switch sides again and tell her older brother, okay, I... I believe that you're the rightful king and I'm perfectly loyal to you now Yeah, because there weren't any other options. It's another interesting point that um, Isabella's father um, had left, I guess in his will, had arranged for financial security for his younger children. However, which had not been King Enrique had not honored those wishes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Isabella and Alfonso were, um, they weren't really rolling in the dough, you might say. <laughs> they were very dependent on the good graces of their older half brother. Yes. And um, it didn't, it, it was it was a very, tum- tum- I can't ever say this tumultuous, word, tumultuous <laughs> relationship. Gosh. Okay, anyways, so moving on. So from that point on, after the short-lived rebellion with her brother, she was basically just very quiet. She was the princess and presumed heir by most of Spain, well, most of Castile, Mm -hmm. and uh, the other neighboring courts. But her older brother had a child, but during the rebellion, he had been forced to sign a document saying that she wasn't his. Mm -hmm. So you have this confusion over whether or not that statement stands or what, or once he regained power, he said, no, she's definitely mine. But he said that Isabella was his heir. So everyone was confused. Yeah. uh, It it just, it was all over the place for quite a while. A lot Mm -hmm. of, yeah, a lot of chaos. Okay. So, you want to get into more detail of that or should we move along? We should probably move on because the next part folds in pretty easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you want to... There were... Um, I, I don't think it's a secret at this point that she ended up marrying Ferdinand. Yes. But there were several other attempted betrothals. Some very interesting ones in there, actually. Right. And like we said, she was being, you know, the good princess who, you know, shows up at the events and, you know, opens the hospitals or whatever they did specifically back then. Mm-hmm. And that included having her brother send out, you know, basically uh, flyers <laughs> to the other courts saying <laughs> princess available. <laughs> <laughs> it was very much a business um, transaction, marriages, yeah. royal marriages, even, I mean, yeah. Definitely. So some of the candidates in the running were um, Alfonso of Portugal. Yes. Who was her cousin. King Alfonso, which would have made her a queen, you know, would have made her a queen. Yes. Um, but just a disclaimer, he is very much older than her, mm-hmm. her cousin, and he already has heirs of his own. So she would be a second marriage. Right. Which means that her children um, would effectively inherit nothing. Yeah. They just kind of disappear. And she would basically just be the the extra queen in Portugal. Um, I believe she was also betrothed to oh, what was the name? P- uh, Pacheco, P- Pedro. Juan Pacheco. Yes, Pacheco. Yeah, I remember that one. And he, a nobleman from Castile. He was the brother of a favorite yes. of King Enrique. The favorite being Juan Pacheco. The brother's name was Pedro Acuna Pacheco. Mm-hmm. Um, and I believe this was the one that Enrique really, really wanted to, to happen because he didn't. My understanding was he didn't really like the idea of her marrying the king of Portugal because he didn't want her to be a queen or something like that. And then what ended up happening later, which I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but um, with Ferdinand, he didn't like that at all either. And the other thing you have to remember is that there's a competition going on in Spain at this time. Castile is the biggest country, but Portugal and Aragon, which are their uh, right and left neighbors, (laughs) um, are both related to them 
and in competition with them. Mm -hmm. They both want to be as prominent as Castile. And to some degree, they want to inherit or take the throne of Castile. Right. Oh, I think I should mention this is kind of funny. When she was officially betrothed to Acuna Pacheco, she, that is Isabella, was just absolutely not horrified happy. and she um she basically just like devoted herself to prayer and supplication that the marriage mm -hmm. you know wouldn't happen and what do you know but this guy don pedro just like fell dead on his before, way to meet her yeah before they could even meet yeah. how crazy is that yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> we wonder if it was the prayers or if it was something i'm just kidding there's, i don't think there's any evidence of that it was just kind of a it just it went her way let's say Okay, let's see. I believe there was... Oh, England. Yes, there's another one. I'm going through the notes here. Um, there was a discussion. Okay, this is this is interesting. Correct me. Keep me on, on the rails here. So there was a discussion of her being married off to Edward IV of England. Yes. Who was the... Okay. The brother... Okay, there's a connection to Richard the Third, and I can yes, never. Yes, he's keep Richard the Third's older brother. That's what it was. Okay, Richard the Third's oldest brother, and that's cool for us because our very first, first episode, episode of this podcast was on Richard the Third. Yes, um, and you know the whole story about um how he ended up marrying uh, Catherine, what's her name? I mean, uh, Elizabeth Woodville. There you go. And that's a whole. We already went through that story. Yes. That, <laughs> go back to our first episode, Richard the Third. Please don't judge us for you know our um the way that it went because we were brand new to this. <laughs> but anyway, so but it's fun background. So like if you're ever listening to another podcast or a TV show or a book mm -hmm. that's about the Wars of the Roses and it gets to Edward the Fourth and Elizabeth Woodville, Isabella could have been the queen. Isn't that crazy? Yes. Yeah. But it didn't. I don't think that was particularly serious. And it, of course, no, they were happen. much more serious about marrying him to a French princess. Mm -hmm. But that didn't. But that didn't either. work out either. <laughs> what he did was like speaking of off the rails. Anyway, like I say, it's another story. Go back, listen, look it up. It's entertaining. OK, so after that, I believe there and was, there was an also an offer from the French. Yeah. Louis the 11th. Because they're constantly offering to marry people. <laughs> of course, um, which would have been, I guess, that would have been a good alliance for them. That was, of course, the whole idea that would have ensured, you know, um, well, it's insurance against war. But like you were saying about um, her brother not particularly wanting her to become a queen, mm -hmm. that's important because of what I was saying earlier about the competition going on. She could potentially be a foot in the door for one of the other rivals to get the Castilian throne. Mm -hmm. So he was very wary about offering her to one of the neighbors yeah. because if he died, her claim would go to them and they could take over Castile. Yeah. Okay. Now we get into the, or at least that's how he presumed it would work out. Yes. Okay. Now we get into the, the good stuff. So Isabella rejects this, the French yes. thing. And uh, I think a little background, Isabella and Ferdinand had known each other. They had met and knew each other as kind of, I guess you'd say children. Yes. Because um, they, they married and they were practically still children. I mean, mm -hmm. they were teenagers. But um, so they knew each other. And it wasn't like some random stranger that she was, you know, to be betrothed to exactly. And once again, they're, I believe, their third cousins. Something like that. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um. So after so all that. of these, um, you know, marriage attempts, betrothals that don't happen or people just randomly drop dead, uh, she... The the marriage or is kind of there's a negotiation that goes on between John of Aragon, who is the father of Ferdinand. Yes. And um, long story short, they um, Isabel and Ferdinand, they it's a genuine I should say it's a genuine love match. They like each other. There's a lot of letters between the two of them before they're they're married and it seems as though you know they definitely were putting in an effort yeah to make it you know to make it something they were both okay however with. as i said enrique is not happy about this so oh, no it all has to be arranged in secret there's um there's a lot of sneaking around and moving around in, in secret what ends up happening is that they isabella and ferdinand are married via proxy which means that there are two mm -hmm. other people that stand in their place 
and like, you know, exchange the vows on their behalf and mm-hmm. so forth um, to to make them officially married. They eventually, you know, they meet and have a, a real wedding. But before they can be, you know, officially married because they're Catholic and because they're clo- somewhat closely related, they have to get uh, basically permission from a the papal Pope. dispensation. Thank you. It's all fancy. A papal dispensation to allow them to be married so that their children can be legitimate. And or, their marriage would be legitimate. Yeah. But I mean, it. you wouldn't care except that they're royals and they want to make sure their children yes. can inherit things and titles all and that. all the rest of it. So... Um, well, and I think she would have cared because it would have been you know, a sin. Yeah, yeah. She's very, very Catholic. She would have cared about that. <laughs> I don't think he cared as much. She no, she definitely would have. cared. So anyways, this all happens. They get what they believe is a papal di- dispensation. They're married, yada, yada. I believe it's not until after she she's certainly pregnant. She's probably already had their first child, which is their daughter, Isabella. Mm-hmm. Um, when it is discovered that the papal dispensation was actually a forgery, it was a it was a papal dispensation that was used for someone else previously. Yeah, it was one of um, the they didn't marriages know about in it. Ferdinand's family that had already taken place. Mm-hmm. They erased the old names and forged new ones onto it, so it looked legitimate. Yeah, and then they're like, "Oh yeah, it's totally real." And then several months later, they find out, "Oh wait." It was fake. Yeah. So this is all chaos. Um, I don't, you know, eventually they get which made her brother very happy. Yes, but eventually they do get a papal dispensation. Everything is put to right. Um, Isabella writes to Enrique after the marriage has taken place and asks him to please accept it. To you know, forgive. Yada, well, yada. because like we were saying, she's doing the whole you know perfect princess does yes. what she's told thing. Mm-hmm. While she's doing that. She's also negotiating her own marriage to someone her brother does not like. Yeah. So she was doing a whole like behind the scenes, having secret communications yeah. with foreign courts. I mean, it's it's intense stuff going on. But, and she's in her mid teens. Yeah. Needless to say, the brother, um, I think he responds to the first couple of appeals and after a while they're just he just ceases contact altogether gives him the cold shoulder mm-hmm. there is no more communication for quite a while um well part of this whole situation is that when she had her marriage by proxy and then left in basically the dead of night on yeah. horseback to go and meet Ferdinand, didn't she say she was going to visit her brother's uh grave Grave, or something yeah yeah um okay so while all this is going on her brother enrique the king Mm -hmm. had arranged finally to marry her to the king of portugal because like we said it's like the lesser of all the options because she'd be a queen but she would be a queen without any influence or power Uh but it's too late she's already run off and married the other guy oh and you know something else (laughs) so her brother looks really dumb and the eyes of all the other courts. Uh huh. Something else we didn't mention, and I don't know that many people mention this. It was news to me when I heard about it. Like we said, they're teenagers. They're like, what are they? Sixteen years yeah, old in that range or something. It's like, um, um, I think he's sixteen. She's fifteen. Okay, but get this. So they get married. However, Ferdinand already has like multiple illegitimate oh, children. Yes. You know, and yeah. she's aware of it. It's understood. Well, she wasn't aware of it until. After the real marriage. Really? Mm-hmm. I thought it was before. Anyway, she seems to just kind of, okay. I mean, she would have past, expected it. Whatever. But, it, you know, he Ferdinand continues to carry on in such a manner. Yes. Basically, their entire marriage. Yeah, which. And based on the historical evidence, she does not. No, not ever. Contrary we to know of. some other queens. and. Oh, yeah. She, she was very, like we said, that whole. Uh, modest, rigid, religious thing. She took it very seriously. I mean, she saw the combination of, um, we don't exactly know what happened with her mom, yeah, but some kind of emotional or mental instability. And then she saw the chaos that her brother's wife caused in the court. And she mm-hmm. wants to be the opposite of both of these models. That's another story. The one that had the daughter that yes. definitely, pretty much definitely was not the king's. Anyways, we talked about that. Okay, so... Um, moving along, um, the next thing, the next big thing, obviously, is what makes her king, which is the death of her half brother Enrique. Makes her king. <laughs> <laughs> makes her queen. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, in Spanish, it's the same word, so it doesn't matter. 
Oh, Reyna is queen. That's the feminine. yeah, but they only used Ray. Oh, that's another. St- okay, don't well, we'll don't get, get into ahead. that. Sorry, I know that's a that's an important point. Yeah. Okay, but um, instead of just saying oh, Enrique dies, she's queen. No, um, so before he dies, uh, Isabella goes and they. Long story short, she goes to see him in person because kind he of, stopped answering her letters. Yes, make amends. You know, rebuild the relationship. And so on. She specifically asks for um, Ferdinand to remain kind of at a distance so that, you know, someplace <laughs> Take away. Take a walk. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I have things to do. But it's between her and her brother. You know, there's bad blood. She goes to make amends, supposedly. And uh, Ferdinand was okay because there was a war going on. Yes, he's busy. So he got to go and play with his dad. Yeah, he's doing, you know, things. She goes. And the account that I read was that they... They meet, they kind of, they do, they sort of, they make up, mm-hmm. they spend time together, they go for walks, they do this, all this. And then, um, for, does Ferdinand, no, he, he does, does, yeah, he does. He comes and he yes. meets them. They spend time together. Uh, they have a, I think like a kind of a party basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I'm trying to think what happens after that. It's kind of a, does she leave first? And then, yes, yes, she departs. And then all of a sudden, the king takes ill and dies. Yes. Suddenly. Suddenly. Um, and the only thing that makes me and I'm sure many other his- I'm not a historian, but people that have studied this <laughs> suspicious is that he dies and then she appears just ready with all of these events and elaborate outfits and stuff that clearly would have taken weeks, if not months to prepare. And suddenly she's ready for a coronation and all of this stuff. And so, you know, maybe it was a coincidence. Maybe she thought, you know, I should go ahead and get myself ready. And she had all these things planned or maybe, you know, somebody sped up the process and whatever. So that's the time. Personally think that based on her religious convictions. Yes, but also on her patterns of behavior that she would have been prepared. Yeah. Because she knows it's going to be contested. She is the more um, popular option and she already has an heir. She's married to the heir to another throne. Oh, so I think she would want to be ready to say, okay, this is just the way it's going to be. We're moving on. There is no dispute here. Well, and how about this? How um, Ferdinand takes off for, you know, other parts. And she... Back to Aragon. This all happens. Ferdinand is gone. The brother dies. She's proclaimed queen, has the whole coronation ceremony Mm -hmm. thing. And Ferdinand is not there. He doesn't even know about it. Yeah, she doesn't tell him until a little after. It's all done. (laughs) She does. Yeah, he is not aware until his wife is now the reigning queen, has gone through all these ceremonies and Mm -hmm. all this stuff. And she's governing and all this before. And then he shows up and it's like, whoa, it's a whole nother whole nother world going on and And suddenly she's in charge yeah but also during their um like i guess you call it marriage negotiations it was made very clear that he would not become the king of castile that she would be the queen but it seems like he didn't really uh fully absorb that information no because he threw a tantrum after this happened (laughs) and basically was like what do you mean i'm not going to be the one who's actually in charge and what do you mean i'm not going to be you know like you're supposed to just be the quiet little you know you're a queen but i'm the man therefore i'm going to be and it's i think it's interesting because she this is my opinion she demonstrates a great deal of humility by what she ends up doing which is she's you know in order to i guess keep her marriage from just you know imploding completely well, and keep peace in her new kingdom of which course. like we said her succession was contested she doesn't let it was complicated she's a queen yeah she doesn't let pride and ego get to her so, what she does is she retains the authority i mean i think it's understood that most of the accomplishments that were the things we're going to talk about later on uh she's responsible for it she did, you know, what the, the famous um, commissioning of Christopher Columbus, mm-hmm. the the various war campaign. There's a lot of stuff we could get into. She was the driving force behind it. She was the ruler, but she allowed Ferdinand to kind of to put his name first to be. Um, it's like what do they call it? It's like boilerplate, you know, King yeah. Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, making it seem as though he had 
equal power. Yeah, like he was more involved than he actually was. And alluding to or getting back to what you said earlier, um, instead of, you know, Rey and Reyna, which is king and queen, mm -hmm. it just says, you know, in English, king, like king, the, 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 the masculine version. Reyes. Yeah. So just plural, the kings. Right. As if, like you said, as if they were equal. And in reality, they really weren't. Not in authority. And certainly not an accomplishment. Yeah. And this is also partly not just because she's grabbing power or anything, but this is what the lords of Castile specifically stated. Mm. This is something that they um, discussed in the, um, what would you call it, representative body, the Cortez. And they they were basically like, you have to be queen. He is not king. Right. <laughs> Okay, so now so it was it's not like she's just, you know, I'm going to take all the power. It's, you know, she's doing the thing that her people want yeah. and the wiser decision. Even <laughs> though point. there was some there just there just hadn't been a lot of reigning queens at this point, nope. I guess with these these people. It was kind of it was unusual. Some people were kind of like this is weird or mm -hmm. can can she do this? But of course she she did. It worked out. Okay, so moving along, there were, we don't want to spend too much time on this because there's just a lot. There were a lot of wars and campaigns and whatnot. Um, there, of course, was the war with Portugal. Immediately because she didn't marry the king. <laughs> <laughs> oh, scorned. <laughs> Cast aside. Um, and, you know, like, like we said, um, her brother dies. Uh, she, you know jilted the king of portugal so he's like oh they've got a girl as their leader mm -hmm. i'll attack <laughs> and it didn't work bad idea um let's see here i mean there's a that could be its own episode but um and then there's the whole and this is something that i don't want to get too much into because it can be kind of the weeds there's the taking back of territory from ter you know the places that had been conquered by uh I guess the the Muslims the mm -hmm. was it, it was the help me the Moors thank you the Moor the Moors which was in Gr Granada so Granada was the last was a big standing part of it. emirate in the Iberian Peninsula mm -hmm. at this time yeah so they're the last ones to fight I yeah guess. and she as we said multiple times she being a very devout Catholic it's 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 sold as a religious war. As much as territory, because, you know, it's the, you know, we're going to take it back from this religion and, you you know, impose our religion and so on. And there was a lot of killing and, uh, and the convert or else and that type of thing. Well, and um, at the time this occurred, there are a few things that happened. So after she became queen, um, they received word just a few years later that... Um, at the time, the city of Constantinople had been conquered by the Ottomans and had been renamed as Istanbul. Mm -hmm. And the attack continued into the Balkans. So the Ottomans had all they had broken into Europe, which scared everybody. Then just a few years after that, an attack funded and supported part of the Ottoman Navy invaded Italy into lands that Ferdinand's family owned. So there's there's a lot of threat going on because this is the time period where the Ottoman Empire is really rising and really becoming powerful and taking all the territory that they would end up holding for hundreds of years. Um, so you have all that going on. And then in Spain, which is the country that it was basically like, completely overtaken by the Muslim invasion in the 1100s. Mm -hmm. And over the last several hundred years, it's been a very slow process of the Christian kingdoms retaking land and pushing the Muslim emirates south. Mm -hmm. So if you have the combination of the Ottomans are breaking into parts of Europe they've never made it into before, mm -hmm. and you're the part of Europe that everybody has already been through <laughs> you might start to feel really scared oh what was the name of that ottoman the oh, he was just incredibly bloodthirsty awful um oh, what was his name i can't remember leader of the ottomans and uh, uh -oh. 
Oh gosh, I can't think of it. The one who took uh, Constantinople. Yes. What was his name? I we'll was do a video on. We'll do an episode on him sometime. About it and I can't. Th- anyway, I'm. It's, it's a very famous. Oh my gosh. Anyways. Yeah. Um. That was just. I had nightmares after reading about some of the stuff he did. Just horrendous. Um. But getting go, getting past that. Um. It is not more than a few months after. Uh. Isabella retakes Grenada or takes Grenada. Gr- Grenada. Grenada. I'm sorry. Um. That enter he now enters christopher columbus into the story mm-hmm. who his children actually were pages of the court mm-hmm. which means that they pretty much receive received the same extremely um rigorous and what became kind of famous education as the the children of the, the royal children yeah, she um basically raised them with her son yeah and several other children of nobles Mm -hmm. members of the court and so forth which was an interesting okay so like we said about how her life had been so unstable as a child Mm -hmm. and young adult yeah she basically she creates this whole court system that hadn't really existed before she has education for the boys and the girls she hadn't been educated officially as a child Yeah, she had to kind of she had to educate herself yeah um and she is bringing in other members of the nobility to be raised with her children so that they'll have friends and allies as they grow up. Yeah. People that they can rely on and that have common experiences. Apparently it was so impressive. They were visiting members from other, you know, royal courts and whatnot who remarked on it, how amazing it was that mm-hmm. these young children were learning, you know, Latin and, and, uh, you know, history and mathematics and uh, you know in addition to all the the religious instruction mm-hmm. but yeah girls and boys the girls were taught you know uh, the domestic arts the boys were not i think they well, did um so um you could put it this way um the way the education worked they got all the same uh, uh intellectual education mm-hmm. but then the boys were trained in military training mm-hmm. and then the girls were trained in like I guess you'd call it domestic and logistics training. Yeah. Which makes sense for the time. I mean, that makes perfect sense. Um, But as I said, Christopher Columbus comes on the scene. This is probably the most famous uh, accomplishment of Isabella, which I'd like to reiterate. This is another thing that was, this was her doing. Ferdinand wasn't really particularly involved in the commissioning. I mean, he was Mm -hmm. there, but this was her effort endeavor yeah it was a action of the castilian crown and per, not a joint action yeah of and the per Castilian usual, and Aragonese crowns she her instruction the the uh i think probably genuinely for her but the um official position of these uh adventures endeavors it was to spread the catholic religion yes. more or less pretty much everything was under that umbrella and of course, in addition to that was finding gold and new land and that sort of stuff. Although finding gold may be the wrong way to think about the commissioning of it because they thought that they were going to India. Yeah, I mean, so what ended it was up really happening? to open up a whole new uh, trade route. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> so as I think it's probably most famously known, but if not, Columbus goes on this expedition with the intention he believes he is going to be able to reach the east indies he's trying to find a route to india yeah asia the, yeah the orient you might say the first places that he finds he thinks are yeah. either china or japan yeah. but you know, you know i mean they have very sketchy right. ideas of what these places are like at all so he's commissioned by the crown financed by the crown uh, you know, he has his three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. It all has, there's more details to it. There's an interesting story. There's a really good book I should point out. Um, and I'll, I'll add the, the link under, um, in the description on YouTube. Uh, you and I have both read this book. It's, I think it's just called Isabella Yes. by, I think her name is Kirsten Downey. I think that's her name. Yeah. It is, it is a extremely detailed book from the beginning of her life all the way to the end. And in every one of these topics that we've discussed and some that we haven't had a chance to get to, she goes into immense detail, some mm-hmm. background that doesn't necessarily involve Isabella, but it all ties together. So there is a lot more to the, you know, what happened before Columbus set off and how he got the ships and his crew and all the rest of it. And so also the political situation going on in her kingdom at the time. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So they had just completed a war. So low on money, but high on morale. <laughs> yeah. Got that going on. <laughs> and um, you've got this whole sort of uh, crusader spirit that's uh, been resurrected in Spain yeah. because, you know, they had just been fighting a war against a Muslim opponent. And this seems to start to get kind of hardened into the culture. Right. And they're saying, oh, well, we can, you know, send ships out on this expedition and they'll bring back money and we'll use it to finance more wars. So there, there's a lot of things going on. It's a very um, evolving situation in Spain. <laughs> oh, for sure. OK, so, uh, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but Columbus departs. It takes about is it about two months to get from, you know, Spain, that area to what, the New World, mm-hmm. which where does he first land? Is it Cuba? Somewhere in the Bahamas. Bahamas. We don't know which island it was. Yeah. But somewhere, somewhere there. In the Bahamas, we think. He makes several trips back and forth. He does, I believe he he uh, finds his way to what's known as Cuba. He certainly discovers Hispaniola, mm-hmm. which is now the Dominican Republic and uh, Haiti. Mm-hmm. Um, and he and his crew, of course, they, uh, they meet the, the locals, the natives, Mm -hmm. which, um, I guess that's why here we say, um, Indians or it's native Americans, but he thought that he had found India, India. So So that's why he referred to them as Indians. Yeah. That was, it was propaganda. It was (laughs) because it most certainly was not India. (laughs) Trying to convince many, many thousands of miles away from there. So, and I think... I don't know. I take a moment to just say that there, Christopher Columbus, for whatever reason, has become a become a very Hot button topic. polarizing political topic, at least in the United States. I mean, I'm sure, and especially in the West, you know, big bad Western European comes to a foreign land, and and you know the whole you know the whole bit. And it is true that there was. Um, Columbus was not a very good administrator. He had to put down many mutiny attempts. There was the very, the very beginning. Um, it seems as though things were fine between them and the Europeans and the natives. But um, after a while, he seemed to think that Columbus seemed to see them as, you know, oh, that wouldn't this be a great source of income so we can enslave them, you know, yeah. and sell them. That is true. That's absolutely true. Um, and so there's good and bad to Columbus, as there are to many of these these people. He was um, towards the end. <laughs> uh, the reason he was kind of cast aside by the crown was because he was behaving Um, abominably and in direct opposition to the orders given by Isabella. She was opposed to slavery. She specifically instructed him to treat the natives with, you know, Christian compassion and kindness and not to do respect, respect, not to do any of the things that, that he and his men ended up doing. So I think it's worth pointing out that he did he he made probably one of the greatest discoveries in human history, certainly with the greatest, um, I guess, results or what has resulted from that discovery. But he did commit, he and his men did commit some horrible atrocities. That's also yes. true. But as I say, I think it needs to be pointed out that it was, that was not under the direction of, of the crown at all. No. So another point about that is that her specific instructions to the, people going on the expeditions was that any native peoples that they encountered were to be treated as though they were citizens of the Castilian crown, which means they they were were not not. to be enslaved Mm -hmm. or murdered or stolen from Mm -hmm. all of these things happened, but these were contrary to their direct orders. Yeah. Um, Because as we said earlier, um, the, the big motivator was supposed to have been spreading the Catholic faith. And as a result of that, um, because of those efforts, uh, it did put an end to the, mm, you know, I guess you'd say savagery of some of the natives, which included cannibalism. It included human sacrifice and other unmentionable horrors. Um, and it did end up in the abolishment of slavery. And what year was it? 15 something? I forget the year. So uh, there are some people who, who criticize the Catholic efforts. And I don't want to get into the religious parts of this, but you can't deny that because of 
of that effort, those horrible things were done away with. More or less. After a very long time. But it did happen, is what I'm saying. I think it's important to point out the good and the bad. You can't just talk about the bad and you can't just glorify it and only talk about the good things, you know, so that it's not this story is not all horrible and, you know, oh, oppressing, whatever. Some That did happen, but there was also good that came out of it. So keep it in perspective. Eventually. Yeah. Most of these sorts of things took many decades centuries to resolve themselves Mm -hmm. anyways okay uh do you want to get past that or you know the columbus thing eventually he lost favor and then he was replaced and that was the end of it basically and um the expeditions continued on throughout the rest of isabella's reign Mm -hmm. and she didn't really live to see the colonies officially established Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of that happened under her successors, yeah. but she was there overseeing the beginnings. Yeah. Um, something else that she oversaw, and this is, in my opinion, a downside, the much famed or infamous, uh, Spanish Inquisition. Yes. We should definitely cover that. Do okay. You talk so about that? after the conquest of Granada, uh, hmm, what exactly would you call it? There was a lot of uncertainty in Spain mm-hmm. about loyalties and about orthodoxy, especially in regions that had just been conquered, where they pe- the people living there had been under Muslim rule for as long as anyone could remember. Mm-hmm. So if they were Christian... They were Christians who had been practicing in a non-Christian country. So Mm -hmm. sort of uh, separated from the rest of their community. Same thing uh, for any Muslims who were now in Christian lands. So it's a reversal. And since they just finished a war and everybody's afraid that the Ottomans are going to just invade everywhere and take things over, people started being really worried about... I guess, what do you call it? Fifth column yeah. where you have people who are in your country who want to work for your enemies. Yeah. And this paranoia just kept building up. Now, at first, the real targets of the Inquisition were actually the Jewish community. Yeah. Because there was a large effort to um, proselytize the Jews and bring them into the Christian community. But there was also a equally strong suspicion amongst what you would refer to as the old Christians, um, non, um, they were referred to as conversos, Mm -hmm. um, that these conversions were not sincere, that they were just being done for either political or financial purposes. Yeah. And that they weren't really practicing Christians. So... This led to a desire to, I guess, enforce orthodoxy on people. And Never once you a good st- idea. Once you start telling people, let, let's make sure everybody believes the exact same thing. And if somebody doesn't believe it, we'll have to punish them somehow. It always goes to very dark places. Yeah. In this case, it led to large numbers of people being killed in riots Um, People being executed by the Inquisition for heresy, which basically means that they had claimed to be a Christian and that they had continued to practice um, Jewish religious or cultural practices and not um, repented of it, basically. Or if they had been caught once and then been caught again, Mm -hmm. there's no repenting after being caught the second time. And this is a very complicated subject. As far as the actual trials go, because like I said, they could be convicted for things that were cultural practices, but treated as though they were religious practices. So there were people being convicted all over the place who didn't think they were doing anything that wasn't Orthodox Christian belief. Yeah. And then you had people who really were trying to practice Judaism, but pretending to be Christian because they didn't want to be persecuted. Well, you can understand that. (laughs) So it's, like I said, 
Anytime you threaten people with punishment for not believing the right thing, a lot of innocent people are going to die. And they did. Yes. Sadly. That's, uh, in my opinion, that's one of the larger stains on her mm -hmm. legacy. Just absolutely horrendous. And also something that you can kind of see echoes of through the rest of her family. Interestingly enough, as far as the Spanish royal family goes, she seems to have been like the template that everyone built the culture of that family on afterwards. Mm -hmm. So anytime you hear about the Spanish Inquisition in Spain, or you hear about the Inquisition in um, the uh, Holy Roman Empire, these are her descendants who are following the model of we do what the priests say mm -hmm. and we burn the people who are not doing the stuff we think they should do. Um, some famous examples would be known in england as bloody mary who mm. was isabella's granddaughter Ugh. yeah who was known an for on her. executing protestants yeah she she was wild i'll tell you just the the bit that i've read about her oh my goodness gracious um but just this is a dark part of her legacy and it carried on for several generations of her family who were all very powerful individuals mm-hmm a lot of uh, Holy Roman emperors and so forth. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So moving along, we're getting towards the, the latter, the latter part now. Um, she had, I believe, was it technically seven children, but was it two of them died or were stillborn or something like that? Um, I believe that's right. One was stillborn and I think the other one died young. She had a miscarriage, I think mm -hmm. at one point. Anyway, um, her oldest daughter, Isabella, of course, uh, married, and then her husband passed away. I, I guess she remarried, and she... Okay, so that's an interesting story. Mm -hmm. So um, Princess Isabella yes. was in <laughs> betrothed and then married to the heir of Portugal. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> funny how that keeps turning yes, up. There's a lot of stuff going on between these two families. And then apparently she and her husband became very close and it was like very deep romantic relationship for Manuel her the first of Portugal, yes. And then he died very young. Mm -hmm. Um she went back home and his brother was needing someone to marry because he was now the heir. And he said he wouldn't marry anyone but his brother's former wife. And she very much did not want to marry him. But she was told that it was her duty and her responsibility. So she did. But she was not happy about it. Hmm. Unfortunate. Yes. Well, uh, long story short, she dies in childbirth. Yes. And then... The the next in line, John or Juan, um, and the Ooh. only son, by the way, yes. of Isabella and Ferdinand. And um, just so it's all clear, he was considered the heir to the throne because in Spain, um, while women could inherit the throne, it was still male preference. Yeah. So the oldest son is always the first in line. But yeah. then the daughters are equally inheritors if there is no brother. But sadly, he passes away not long after his marriage. And he had been married. To <laughs> okay. So he married the um, daughter of the Duke of Burgundy. Mm -hmm. And um, she had moved to Spain on their marriage and become very close to Isabella. Kind of a, uh, you know, like one of her daughters. Are we talking about uh, Margaret of Austria? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Called Margaret of Austria because her family is the House of Austria, but also the Dukes of Burgundy. A Habsburg. Yes. Mm. They and this is where the Habsburgs in, enter Spain. Uh -huh. um, I do want to talk about the youngest child of Ferdinand and Isabella, who, which was Catherine of Aragon. Now, that should, you know, get attention. Yes. Uh, she, she becomes famous for, you know, in different reasons. She is married off to Arthur, the Prince of Wales england um but he dies and she ends up being one of the many wives of king henry the eighth yes so his first one everything is just so connected and interrelated and it's just it, it oh it's even stranger when you remember that um so isabella is a descendant of the kings of england 
Oh, so that's they're, right. they're actually cousins. Oh, her. What? It, okay. Really distantly. Ka- I think that the relative was Catherine. Catherine. Yes, Catherine of Lancaster. Yes, Lancaster. Thank you. That's her. I forget. And that's where the name Catherine came from in the family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She was. She was somewhat quite proud of that, I believe. Yes. Okay. So, and <sighs> Catherine of Aragon was she? She was one of the ones that wasn't executed right she was the one that henry the eighth tried to divorce so he could marry anne boleyn yes okay and that's where the break with rome occurred Mm -hmm. that's where which was that's a lot of that's big stuff right there yeah huge stuff yeah no the the departure from catholicism Mm -hmm. essentially all because of that all because henry the eighth just couldn't keep it together you know Mm -hmm. and it's Often stated that she seems to be the one who um, was the most like her mother mm-hmm. in temperament yes, and I've in, um, I don't know, I guess you'd say her mindset. Very determined, very, um, very strong in her beliefs. Yes. Uh, and so we're getting to the end now. Um, the, I believe she was the third child. I think that's right. Juana or Joanna of Castile Mm -hmm. after the death of her older sister and brother uh, ends up becoming the heir to the throne. Although we can discuss in a moment how that really didn't really work out for her. Um, But she was married to a Habsburg prince. Yes. So Philip of Habsburg. So detail to that. Her brother Juan married uh, Margaret of Austria Mm -hmm. and Juana married Philip of austria mm-hmm. so it's a brother and a sister marrying a brother and a sister and they traded daughters oh i can't believe Juana was sent to flanders and margaret yeah. was sent to spain i can't believe i didn't mention or we, we didn't discuss before getting into all this how the the brokering of the marriages of these children was like a a multi-decade oh thing. huge like deal I- isabella i mean the the, the marriage between um uh, catherine and Arthur, the Prince of Wales, it took like 13 years or something back and forth. The delegate, the Spanish delegation and the, the English delegation, the the, the hammering out the, mm-hmm. the deal, the the dowry. Oh, the, and the I mean, it's just like it was like a, of the details of that one was that it's like a merger was that the Spanish crown required that there be no other claimants to the British throne before she came to marry their son. Yeah, because so, that would have been a, a, a bum deal. So they ended up executing a couple of people. Uh, well, you know. And that led to, later on, Catherine believed that those executions were responsible for her not being able to have sons. Hmm. A curse, I see. Yes. Interesting. Or superstition. I don't know. Anyway. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah, all of these marriages, they didn't just happen. They were... They were brokered. They were huge issues of state. Yes. Yeah. Um, wow. What a pain, though. Supposedly, uh, Isabella, while they were to be, you know, advantageous marriages, she she wasn't interested in forcing her children to marry, you know, people that were significantly older, like the girls older than them or unattractive or, mm-hmm. you know, so a, a lot of care was taken to find suitable matches that were not um you know ridiculous in some way yeah. or other you know because that had happened to her uh and her she'd brother had to run away in the middle attempted of the night to marry her <laughs> off to you know older un- you know people she wasn't interested in type of thing so she didn't want that for her children anyway and in some cases it's worked some would say too well <laughs> at least with juana because she became very attached to her husband uh, well and he was not the kind of man that you should really have let your daughter become attached to <laughs> Anyway, we should we can that could be another that episode. That can be another episode. There's a lot of details. There's a lot of rabbit trails you can go on. <laughs> um okay, so let's see. I think we need to probably wrap it up, but I don't want to miss big things. So the marriages of the children at uh w- whatever point it was, her mother eventually passes away. She's mm-hmm. been in the the convent basically all these years. Supposedly uh Isabella is, had continued to visit her yes, through this time. On a regular basis, she would go and she would personally, you know, like wait on her and yes. you know spend the time that she could with her. Show her respect. Yeah. So the mother passes away, and although she's been hidden away for all these years, uh Isabella insists on a you know, like a funeral befitting a queen and all this. So she's laid to rest, and then um 
I guess we probably need to 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 rein it in. Uh, uh, Elizabeth um, withdraws from government affairs in Elizabeth. September. Did I say what? I, yes. Isabella. Isabella. <laughs> you know what I mean. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's getting late over here. September fifteen oh four, and she dies the same year, a um, mm -hmm. couple months later. And um, cause of death isn't really certain, but it seems like she was pretty sick for that last year, and yeah. she was expecting to die pretty much at any time. She's and that buried was her in reason for withdrawing. Granada, mm -hmm. um, next to her husband. And, well, um, he didn't die yet, but he eventually made it there. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> eventually she's buried there. Her husband's buried there. Her, some of her children. Anyway, so they're all in Grenada. Put it that way. Um, uh, Grenada. 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 <laughs> Grenada's the island in, you know. Sorry. The, the spelling, it looks like it can be either one. <laughs> Anyways, you're just, it's a distraction. Sorry. Okay. So, <laughs> and, you know, you can see her crown and scepter in a... Um, one of the museums over there, I believe it's, it's is it Cap, Cap, Capilla Real or something like that? Cap, Cap, whatever. Um, it's a museum in Spain. So you can see it. But so on her death, her daughter Juana ascends, to, ascends the throne. to the throne. But. But her husband is a jerk and her father is as well. So mm -hmm. they basically collude to declare her insane, lock her up and take control of her kingdom. When we do the episode on Ferdinand, I have a lot to say about him. There is a lot to say about him. A lot of the men, there are some good, but there are a lot he's of not the men a boring in these, subject, no, but he's not a pleasant subject. He's has issues, had issues anyways. So that's, that's pretty much it. As I say, <laughs> There is a lot more to this. If you want so more much. details on her life, I recommend the book uh, Isabella by Kirsten Downey. I'm sure there are others I, I've watched. We didn't even talk about the connection she had with the popes. I know that could be its own thing. Because in this time, several of them were Spanish. Yes. There was a lot of effort to make sure that Spain was represented in the Vatican mm -hmm. because, you know, apparently it was mostly others. There weren't a lot of Spanish in the what is it like the, the college of cardinals or whatever i'm not really up on my Catholic well and in this time i mean spain is like the rising power it had just been like you know oh it's a bunch of little kingdoms yeah. and they they're fighting with the muslims and now it's like the most powerful group of kingdoms in europe right so yes that is the life the extremely interesting tumultuous and accomplished life of isabella who was to, uh, isabella of of Castile. Castile and Leon, technically. Yes. Correct. So, but most people just think of Ferdinand and Isabella, Spain, Christopher Columbus. There's so much more to her. There is so much more to her life, to her family. Um, the, the contributions to some of the biggest moments in history, Western or mm -hmm. otherwise, I don't think we could possibly do justice to that in a short little podcast episode. I'm telling you, it is massive. Highly it recommend is. that you, you know, look farther into her life, read, watch documentaries, whatever. There's a lot of great resources out there. We tried to touch on as much as possible, but it's just <laughs> it, it's just it's voluminous yeah. material. And it's also it's an interesting subject also because you can see the short term goods that she did mm -hmm. in her life, the positive accomplishments. And then you can see the bad things that she did that without any uh, connection to her, the people who did them eventually led to good things being possible, mm -hmm. even though very bad, destructive things led to those. Yeah. So things like the discovery of America, it had its positives and it had a lot of negatives, mm -hmm. but it led to a lot of positives. Yeah. And then the Inquisition, it eventually because it became so oppressive, led to a reform of the church and an end to those repressions. And it also led to all sorts of movements of people and new interactions between different nationalities and individuals. So things that no one could control, but that eventually had outcomes that no one would have expected. Yeah, we are in a funny way. We are direct beneficiaries of her commissioning 
of Columbus, if you think about it. Here in Florida, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, I, everywhere in America, but yeah. You know what I mean, the new world. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, okay, I think we've gone on long enough. What do you think? I think that we've covered pretty much everything. Because some of the things now. that we missed here, we can probably talk about in the episode about Ferdinand, because yeah. obviously they go together. So, all right. Well, um, thank you so much for listening. As always, we appreciate your time. As I said, um, the resources or resource that I mentioned and probably some of the others, um, I'll put uh, a link in the description on YouTube for your uh, for your reading pleasure or if you just want uh, more information about Isabella and her life and and whatnot, because as, as I say, it's extremely interesting. Um, anyway. Thank you to our followers. Make sure that you keep up with us. Uh, we're on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, um, mostly on YouTube. Uh, I post, I try to post on a daily basis. Uh, Instagram is a, is a close second. Uh, but uh, I think the next episode will probably be Ferdinand unless we want to mix it up and throw in something else and then come back to Ferdinand. But um, yes. yeah. it'll either be Ferdinand or we may be doing a special episode. Yes, could be. Could be one of our first or something like that. First yes. kings, <laughs> first royals or whatever. Anyway, thanks so much for listening and uh, we'll catch you next time. Bye.